Hey everyone, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 24. 24. Do you have a, a number 24 you wanna? Sergey Makarov? There you go, that's yeah. a good one, I like yeah. it. So uh, obviously we're back in interview format. This is the, uh, I think it was uh, Brad from Sports Meets Beer had said, you're the only person I know who would go out, get braces, <laughs> and then start a, 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 a YouTube show, <laughs> right? That's the stupidest thing you can do. Yeah, yeah, well I decided to do the whole Movember thing and then schedule three interviews in a row with yeah. this nasty thing. <laughs> so, is what it is. Anyway, obviously we've got Kevin Kurz here from The Athletic on the show. He's gonna be talking some Sharks hockey with us today, so it's gonna be a really awesome episode. So we'll be talking about uh, Eric Carlson, Joe Pavelski, amongst other things. Uh, we'll talk about the team being deep and uh, being in the Pacific Division, if that's a good or bad thing. Yeah. Okay, so you ready to start the show? Ready. Good. Okay, and, um, oh, jeez, I'm sorry. I was up late at a Drake concert last night. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how long it would take to get to that one. <laughs> So uh, anyway, uh, we're going to get to Kevin in just a second. I wanted to address uh, one thing real fast. Actually, two things. One, uh, right behind me here, the uh, Hockey Fights Cancer, the uh, purple jersey. I was able to pick that one up today. So I uh, just wanted to kind of showcase it. We've got it on the set now, as if you couldn't see it. But uh, really cool. Has a little patch on the side, Hockey Fights Cancer. So um, they are selling those in the shark store still. And I was fortunate enough to find one in my size. So I was able to pick that up. That's awesome. The other thing I wanted to, to tell you guys again, uh, the mobro.co slash the fin factor. I'm not growing this thing because I think it looks good. <laughs> um, hoping you guys will uh, find it within yourselves to donate if you can. Anything helps. One uh, dollar. If we had all of our subscribers giving me a dollar, that would be the entire goal right there. So um, if you can find it within yourself to do that, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Or you could pay two dollars to have him shave it off. <laughs> can I just give you a dollar? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> probably make uh, probably make more money uh, getting people to for me to shave it off. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's get to our guest, Kevin Kurz. Kevin, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, thank Good you to for be here. Yeah, coming on the show. Appreciate it. Yeah, so, no wanna... uh, yeah, let's let's go. Let's start with your career before the athletic. Okay. Run us through briefly. Of yeah, I took a little bit of a weird path. Um, I was uh, originally in PR, and the first job I had was the PR guy for uh, the Philadelphia Phantoms, which was the Flyers minor league team, mm -hmm. and. Um, as a matter of fact, John Stevens, who was the just fired as the <laughs> head coach of the Kings, was the head coach of that team at the time. So I started uh, in, in PR, and then I moved over to the Flyers after a couple years in, with the Phantoms. And that was kind of when websites were becoming important, and every team's like, well, we need to have a website here. So mm -hmm. I had the journalism background, sort of like, here, you just take the website. And that was the days where... One person was doing everything. You, I'm doing the writing. I'm doing the working with the marketing team, uh, and then video came into play and social media and all that stuff. Uh -huh. And now you see teams with you know six, seven person staffs doing their digital media. Um, when I was doing it for f the Flyers, it was kind of just me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was great. Um, we were really one of the first teams, along with the LA Kings, to tr send. Uh, someone on the road with the team to cover the team and um, I started doing that in um, what year would that have been when was the lockout the year after the lockout oh five oh six yeah <laughs> yeah um, and then I did that for uh, up through 2010 um, when Patrick Kane scored in overtime to beat the Flyers in the Stanley Cup final mm -hmm. yeah um, went to the Comcast corporate office. That was lame. So like, <laughs> let them convince me to come uh, cover the Sharks when CSN, then CSN, was building up their mm -hmm. um, their uh, you know journalism journalism department. I guess mm -hmm. hiring all these writers, um, and then I was there for six years. Nice. Yeah. So, so you know, most people in my job have worked for a newspaper at some point. Yeah. Not as many with the athletic. The athletics now hiring people from different fields and different backgrounds. But you know, when I started covering the Sharks, it was I'm just. I must have been the only beat writer that never actually worked for a newspaper. Yeah, wow. yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I uh, go, go ahead. ahead. I'd say quick take on gritty. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I can understand how they're trying to get some young fans there because for years, the Flyers were just relying on the Broad Street Bully days. And like mm, Christ, yeah. I'm, I wasn't even alive when the Broad Street Bully, <laughs> yeah. was, you know, when that was in the mid '70s. Um, and a lot of those fans are getting older. So I think what they're trying to do is just you know, appeal to the younger fans and every team. And, and you know what, that's what drives, and, and speaking about the Sharks in that vein, you know, that's why I think the Sharks need more afternoon games. Mm -hmm. You want to bring your kids, you need to build a, a younger fan base. And, you know, you do that by having afternoon games where parents can bring their kids. And I know the Barracuda yeah. here, so maybe that can help, but um, 
you know, I can see what the Flyers are trying to do by, try, uh, you know, getting some That's more kids involved. True with us. Yeah. We, bring, we have young kids, too. Yeah. yeah. So. No, I was going to say, I just, just came from a Barracuda game, actually. They had a 5 o'clock game. I can't remember who they were playing, but uh, it was uh, Colorado Avalanche's right. um, farm okay. team. So that was that was a fun one, too. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about was uh, it, there was an article that you wrote a long time ago, saying why you went to the athletic. Right. Yeah, and we all had to kind of do this. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and in that article, you had said that um, the comment section was kind of refreshing and that there was, like, civil engagements and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Do you still find that to be the case? I know that we've got... Um, yeah, absolutely. There's different platforms yeah. that you're on. There's comment section within your article, but then there's also, like, Twitter and whatnot, and those are two very different animals, I'm sure. But <laughs> yeah, do you see sure. yeah. more civil interaction still within the comments? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even if someone disagrees with your opinion, which it's sports, you know, it's, yeah. that's supposed to happen... Um, uh, it's yeah, pretty civil, and 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 uh, you know, I, you appreciate as a writer, you know, when when people are paying to read your stuff, it kind of does reinforce, reinforce like, you know, I better do good work here, and sure, I better yeah, work my yeah. butt off, and 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 write stuff and, that people find interesting and people are willing to pay for. So, um, you know, it, it's that's that's important to me, and I think that's important to everybody that works at our company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got a quick question, a couple of guests. Do you miss being on TV as much as you used to be on? Because I don't feel like you're on as yeah. much anymore. No, I'm not. I don't do any NBC stuff. I do yeah. some NHL Network stuff. I do miss it sometimes. I, I like the pregame hits. I like going mm -hmm. on with Brody and Curtis and, and whoever else it was. And because you know they their their show is is not always overly critical. And and I was never I'm never not yeah. I'm yeah. never afraid to go that go yeah. that route. So. Um, I thought that was uh, I, I liked that part of the show. Uh, That's a good bounce between yeah. you guys. Yeah, yeah. So I do miss it. Um, they can ask me anytime. Yeah, I mean they're gonna have to pay hint. me now. But <laughs> 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 I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do miss it. I, I liked I like doing the pregame. But you know that said, it's also nice to be able to take my time and work on the written content yeah. because that's always the part that I like the most and mm -hmm. when I don't have to get to the rink at 4.30 and do four different TV hits before a game it gives me time to work on something else you know written content that otherwise I might not have enough time for. Yeah. So, so coming from Philly and then um, coming into the Bay Area mm -hmm. um, first of all how difficult is that transition for you and then kind of having I guess uh, like rapport with the fans because you know you're the Philly guy, and then yeah. also, are you becoming a San Jose fan? Are you a fan, or h how would you describe that? Yeah, no, I, I fans not the right word. Okay. I mean, look, when you see Joe Thornton scores 400th goal and it ties, I mean that's that's just right. cool, yeah, right? right? Like yeah. that's great, and and uh, so you know, and when it, no one wants to cover a <laughs> team either, am I allowed to say that? Yeah, sure. no one wants to yeah, cover. Please. <laughs> you don't want to watch a bad product for 82 games, right? Yeah. I mean, every beat writer would tell you that it's it's more enjoyable to cover a good team just just because you know you don't want to watch bad hockey for for you know I, I feel bad for the for the writers that have to cover a rebuilding team like that's right. no fun, right? Or if you're a baseball writer and your team's out by May, it's like, geez, I got <laughs> yeah. 100 more games of this I got to do. So, um, so. Fan is not the right word. You okay. know, it's it's nice when the team does well, but I, I'm not. You know, I don't. I certainly don't sweat over wins and losses yeah. at all. Uh, it doesn't phase me one way or the other. Um, coming here was a little difficult because I remember, you know, my first year. I remember they threw me right on TV, and I just remember thinking, if I'm a Sharks fan, like who the hell is this guy? <laughs> right. So like the first the first year was. I remember I lost like 15 pounds. I was. Yeah. Uh, you're working every day. I was going on the every road game, so I had zero social life. Z to, didn't meet anybody. Um, so the first year was tough, but after that, it was. Uh, you know, I've I come to enjoy it really more and more every year. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think on this show, we, I mean, we're fans, obviously. Uh, I think we try to give a perspective that's. Less of an actual fan where we're, you know, getting really high on the highs and getting really low on the lows. You right. Know? So we try to get kind of in that that middle ground. So it is it's nice to have somebody uh, who's talking about the sharks who isn't a fan necessarily because you kind of get that unbiased view. Yeah, I'll of, tell you what, I have no problem telling you what I think. So. Yeah. Oh, that's, good. <laughs> that's good. That's that's what people should want to hear. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, I hope that's what you know. That's what I think our subscribers at our site really want. So yeah. yeah. Good. Well, related to to Carlson coming across. Mm -hmm the country into mm -hmm. a new country um, kind of related to what you did too coming across the country yeah. how difficult was that just moving to the Bay Area and learning I, I had this great question for Navi that you didn't ask thanks but uh, <laughs> learning 101 680 880 oh. 280 <laughs> Yeah, eighty, you know, eighty-seven, eighty-five, mm -hmm. seventeen, all those freeways and everything. And like uh, Dan Rusinowski had a point when 
he was on last week about you know Carlson and his wife moved out here. They have to learn how to get to the hockey rink. Yeah. Like yeah. they have to learn everything. Your your whole culture completely changed. So, just how difficult was that coming? I mean, you're from Philly, from right? How so difficult was it for me? For you, and then and yeah. then related to Carlson doing the same thing, basically. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a little different. I think when you're a hockey player, you're walking to and you're walking into a dressing room where you automatically have you would hope 20, 20 new friends. Yeah. to help you along with that sort of stuff. So, uh, I think it was probably diff more difficult from from my point of view when I'm coming here by myself and I don't know anybody mm -hmm. and everybody I meet up at work is in San Francisco at our studio. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, it, you know, it is what it is. It's, yeah. People do that all the time. Um, you know, for Carlson, obviously, g going from one team to another after it's all you've known is yeah. everyone I've talked to, every hockey person I've talked to said it's going to take some time. There's going to be a transition period. It's going to take maybe 20, 25, even 30 games. And, you know, maybe we're starting to see that now with them because yeah. I think you know, the last three or four games have been, he's been outstanding. Mm -hmm. And starting to be, I think we're starting to see some more consistency with him. Yeah, and uh, speaking of Carlson and, and the consistency, consistency he's starting to build, he's finally got that monkey off of his back. He's got that <laughs> first goal out of the way. Um, yep. I kind of see that as kind of the, the dam breaking, right? I, I think this is where we're going to start seeing more and more of him in uh, in terms of on a score sheet. Um, do you kind of feel the same way, that this is like the opening up for him? Well, we'll see. I mean... The way Pete talked about it after the game that he scored that first goal was, you know, he had that great chance at the end of the first period, and, and Pete said you could even see it on his face yeah. when he missed that one. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then he scores that goal, and it's it's it doesn't matter who you are. It's a huge weight off your shoulders, and it's not like he's a 50-goal scorer or anything, but right. still, mm -hmm. when you've got that zero next to your name and you're a guy that's counted on to create offense, it's going to bother you. Yeah. So, um but I think just in general, you know, this homestand, I think we've, we've, we've seen him get a little bit better. And I thought it was interesting, too, because if, if you go to the first game of this homestand against Calgary, you know, he only played 18 and a half minutes or so. Right. Which, and I looked it up, that was the fewest, his, his lowest ice time in seven years. Wow. And I don't know if that was, I haven't asked Pete about it, I haven't asked Eric about it. I, I don't know if that was maybe some sort of message from Pete, or maybe he just wanted to give him a little bit more time on the bench to, to rest. Uh you know, it had been suggested to me that he didn't have a training camp and he, maybe he was getting worn out a little bit playing 25, 26 minutes a night. Um, so it's interesting because after that game, I think we've seen him, uh, I think we've seen him be, he just looks more comfortable and it looks like he's creating more out there yeah, than, than uh, he, since then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, we're looking at him on the power play. I mean, he's, he's really controlling the puck really well. I see him walking the blue line a lot, very confidently. Yeah. There's one of the things I noticed about him, he doesn't seem to panic. When he's that's got the puck. absolutely right. Yeah, I think that's what he's kind of known for. Yeah. Is he's so calm uh, um, with the puck. A lot of those Swedes are like that for yeah. whatever reason. You know, the Swedes and the Finns are, are yeah. so calm under pressure. That's why you see so many Finnish goalies. I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I would agree with that I think that's the str that's his strength is he doesn't panic and. Um, you know, we we've seen that a lot, and, yeah. and you know he's never going to be great in his own end defensively. Sure. Um, but you know the the. The, the poise and the patience with the puck and, you know, just his ability to to skate uh, when he gets going and, and you know, to, to find open teammates is, you know, that's why he's a superstar. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, and let's shift over to Pavelski now, the mm -hmm. captain. It's kind of a big talking point, I guess, the last <laughs> week now that he's been on fire. Yep. Um, a lot of people, well, his big complaint or the big complaint that people have <laughs> is that he's too slow. But he's been told that his entire career. Right. Like, there's, there's nothing new there, right? No, I think he no. even says that himself, or he's like, they always say that every year. So he always gets his goals. He's always getting yeah. 20 to 30 goals, depending on the year. Um, I guess, two part question uh, What do you see from him this year, and then what's going to happen next year? What? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this year, obviously, he's healthy. You know, if you go back to last year, he had some lower body issues, he had a wrist injury in training mm -hmm. camp, then he broke his finger. And he was still playing through all that. You know, that's why he's the captain. He's not gonna. He didn't want to sit out. He didn't want to take any time off. He played through it. He wasn't 100. percent You could see it on the ice. He wasn't playing very well. Um, so you know, the fact that he's healthy and he, he's remained healthy throughout the course of the season so far, that's a big reason. But you know, Todd McCullough and Pete DeBoer both. It, it's funny. They bo they've both used the same sort of analogy when they talk about Joe Pavelski, and that is, you know. He's the perfect guy I would want my kid l trying to emulate in terms of working hard and attitude mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just that desire to get better. And that's, you know, that's why Joe Pavelski's the first one on the ice 
for practice almost every single day. Um, he's out there all the time working on his game. Um, you know, I don't think anyone expected him to be tied for fourth in the league in goals like he is right now. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, just his hot, his hockey IQ combined with, you know, his willingness to go to those hard areas of the ice, um, you know, that's why he is who he is. Yeah, and I do see him out there at practices. I see you out there at the practices yeah. too, but yeah. I see him out there all the time, uh, him and Burns. Mm -hmm. Pavelski's just sitting in front of the net just with the stick out, and Burns is just firing him on him and it's just hilarious seeing how he just every single puck he doesn't miss it's one it's of amazing them. I, I remember watching one time i saw him do li literally i saw him tip nine from right in right i don't know if they all went in but he got his stick on yeah just nine and that's you know brent burns isn't firing softballs yeah. either i mean he's throw, he's it was it's unbelievable yeah it's, it's really something to watch yeah, yeah. He's, he's pumping him in there yeah. so it's it's yeah it's incredible but uh one of the things that we've said or at least i've said on the show is i don't see the the sharks as having like a first, second, third, fourth line so much as mm -hmm. three really solid offensively capable lines and then what I'm calling the low utilization line, um, kind of the, what's the traditional fourth, right? Yeah. Where they're not putting them out there as often. The, the minutes are lower, yes, but the first, second, and third lines in a traditional sense are kind of just three really good lines. I have a hard time saying any one of them is the top line or mm -hmm. one of them is like the third. When you're talking about a third line with um, with Evander Kane, Sumela centering and he's been playing really well, and or Thornton, yeah. right, on the third line. Yeah, yeah and they've been time. mixing them up so much too lately. It's, you know, some 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 of it because of injuries to either Thornton or yeah. Hurdle or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of it just because you're not playing very well. So, but you're right. I mean, that's that's a luxury when you can put Joe Thornton as your third line center. And, um, you know, I, I the fourth line hasn't been very good. I, I think they still need another center at some point. Um, we'll see if that happens. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they're scoring, I think it's three or more goals in like 13 of 15 games oh, or wow. 12. I'd have to look it up. But, um, you know, now part of that was because they were cheating for offense and they were leaving the goalie hung out to yeah. try. So uh, I think uh, the Blues game, they got back to their their identity where, you know, they weren't cheating for offense, but mm -hmm. they were still scoring goals and right. playing responsible defensively. So that's the way they want to play. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's a good corner for them to turn to. Kind of give them a little confidence in that. Yeah, I mean, this was works. a big homestand. You had yeah. to find it at some point on a six-game homestand, your longest homestand of the mm -hmm. year where you've been up and down. You know, you really want to see, and they've got two games left, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, I think you really wanted to see them start to establish that foundation on this homestand. And it looks like, you know, you look at the Calgary game and you look at the game against the Blues, That's those are, you know, pretty good models of how they want to play. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, moments in the Nashville game and, and the Toronto game were not very good. So we'll see if that... Blues game leads to some more consistency here. Yeah. So you've been covering the team since 2011, 11, correct? Yeah. So you've seen a lot of rosters over the years. Do mm -hmm. you think this is the deepest team since you've been covering? That's including the Stanley Cup finals. Yeah, team. I do. If you look at all the positions, you know, forwards, you know, uh, wingers, they have an abundance of wingers that, that can put the puck in the net now that you got Evander Kane. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Don Scoy is still streaky. Hurdle, before he got hurt, looked like he was – playing the best hockey I've seen him play. Um, you know, LeBanc is up and down. Um, oh, else am I forgetting? Meyer's playing here. well. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. He's he's really seem, he's seeming to come on. Yeah. Come back down to earth a little bit. He's only shooting 17% right now. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but he does seem to have at least one or two real good chances every night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and a little plug, we have a, I have a pretty long feature on him running uh, on Monday. Yeah. Perfect, uh, great. Talk to his agent. Uh, his agent is kind of like a mentor. Mm -hmm. Goes back to him, uh, goes back with him uh, in Switzerland uh, from like six or seven years ago. Anyway, nice. not to get off topic. No, that's, that's fine. fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then defense, obviously, you know, when Mark Edward Vlasic and Justin Braun is essentially your third pair. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and goalie, too, you know, Aaron Dell is a solid backup. So I, I, would, I, say, I would say that's fair. That's, this is probably the deepest team yeah. um, that they've had since I've been here, yeah. We'll come back to the Aaron Dell thing in a minute because that's another hot <laughs> topic. But uh, Pacific Division is terrible. What? <laughs> terrible. But beginning the season, everyone thought it was going to be a pretty strong division, Yeah, one of the strongest, and now it's looking like it's just – awful yeah so yeah is it, do you think that's a good thing for the sharks obviously because they're most likely going to get in the playoffs yeah, or is it a bad yeah. thing because less competition no i don't look at it as less competition i you know it's still you still got to fight to be one of those top three teams in the division um i thought the kings would be better they look like they're buried um mm -hmm. you know calgary's playing better they uh they could they could really push if they get a they you know find a, a goaltender yeah <laughs> 
Uh, you know, Edmonton's been up and down. Anaheim I don't like this year. Uh, Vancouver's come back down to earth since their hot start. Mm -hmm. uh, Arizona, I still think, could improve. We could see that team improve throughout the course of the year. But, I mean, it sure looks like it's going to be three <laughs> teams from the Pacific and five in the Central in the mm -hmm. playoffs. But I don't look at that as a bad thing. I mean, if you're the Sharks... The key to making a long run in the playoffs is not getting banged up throughout the course of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you know, if you can end up playing the Arizona Coyotes in the first round instead of, I don't know, Vegas or well, or yeah, or, or a Moose, healthy or solid the, Kings team or something. Yeah, like that. Or, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, division, that's like, important. Yeah. yeah, St. Louis or not even St. Louis, Minnesota or mm -hmm. uh, yeah, one of the central Winnipeg, teams. Yeah, 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 you'll take that path all day long. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, well, so I, I heard you say the Ducks in there, but I'm not sure. I think the Ducks have us right where they want us. You know, they're, they're poised <laughs> to strike from the bottom of the. Never mind. Paul's <laughs> salty about uh, Mike Johnson salty. taking that. He in the beginning of the season, he said the Anaheim Ducks are going to win the division. Mike Johnson did, yeah, yeah on NHL Network. Yeah, and, and I laughed at that time. And I, <laughs> I laughed, laughed too. Yeah. yeah, but I did. I did say that Anaheim's got a really good goalie in John Gibson. I gave him that. Speaking of goalies, now, yep. okay, yeah, Martin Jones. There's been some criticism on the soft goals. Right. I have a hard time with some of those goals being labeled as soft goals, and I'm kind of hoping to maybe get what your definition of a soft goal might be. But I thought that he was giving up a few early okay. in the season. Um, my my take on goalies these days is, you know, you can you can watch a game and you can give up four goals, and you can say, well, the goalie wasn't at fault for any of those, and that might very well be the case, but. I think these days with with the best goalies, it's not just not making it's not just making the saves that um, you need to make. You got to come up with one or two big saves a night too. That's what I think wasn't happening and hasn't really been happening okay. with Martin Jones yet. Do you pin losses all on his shoulders? Absolutely not. I mean, the way they were playing in front of him was, yeah. uh, you know, just some egregious mistakes uh, at times um, where he was being hung out to dry on mm -hmm. two on ones on breakaways. Um, but I think we've seen Martin Jones, when he's at his best, he makes the routine saves and he makes one or two spectacular saves a night, like most of the top goaltenders in the league do. And listen, this is a team that's supposed to be a Stanley Cup contender, so yeah. we might be a little bit harder on them than if it's a, if, yeah. if, if Martin Jones was a rookie just breaking into the league, that's one thing. Like, no, he's this guy was signed a six-year contract extension. Mm -hmm. You've got to be better than just good. You got to be. You're getting paid like a starting goalie uh, on a championship team. Play like a starting goalie on a championship team. Now that's not to say he's been bad, but I think he has to be better. Do you think that plays into a part of uh, starter? We were talking about this <laughs> before the show. If Aaron Dell just came off of a yeah. shutout. Do you mm -hmm. start Aaron Dell or do you go back to Martin Jones in the next game? Well, I would think. Yeah, I was thinking that too myself. But then when I looked at the schedule, I would guess he comes back with Jones against. Uh, Edmonton, mm -hmm. and then you got a back-to-back -back Friday, Saturday. I would guess Dell Friday against Vancouver, Jones and Vegas on Saturday. That makes sense. Or the other yeah. way around, but yeah. yeah. Okay. And on the same topic of, of team defense and hanging Jones out to dry, Pavelski was recently quoted saying that after a game that you know, yep. we, yep. we leave him out to dry like that. And, um, you no, know, I been... don't think I've ever heard a player say, <laughs> "My goal, yeah, the goalie was, our goalie yes. was very good tonight. <laughs> be Honestly, that's the one thing that's almost like they never talk about it. So. They wouldn't yeah. be on the team anymore. If they yeah, said that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, yeah, on. I mean, you know, it's admitted, obviously, from, from the captain of the team, so that's, that's got to be good for, for Jones to hear, right? Yeah. Um, I think the other thing is, um, you know, they're, they're second in PK. 89%, mm -hmm. um, I think, is the final percentage as of this recording, at least. So it kind of speaks to the ability of the team to still play really good defensively, but mm -hmm. I think maybe those those are coming off of bad pinches. Um, you know, obviously we have two very skilled offensive defensemen who right. maybe are used to jumping in, uh, playing with a partner who maybe not able to take on two on ones all the time. So yeah, you think and sometimes that's... it's the forwards too, and sometimes it's you know the the it's yeah it was I don't think anybody was off the hook and and Pete De, Pete DeBoer actually kind of said that the other day is like you've got Brent Burns and Eric Carlson are the lightning rods for that just because of how they play, but. Yeah. He's like it was. It's it was everybody. It was forwards. It was uh, you know other defensemen. So I think everyone was at fault there <laughs> yeah. from when they were really breaking down. It's yeah. Not just you know now Burns and Carlson were making some pretty bad mistakes early on. I think, mm -hmm. but and they're going to continue to be caught out of position every once in a while. But mm -hmm. you would hope on the other side they're creating enough offense to to mitigate those mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely, love it. Yeah, it's exciting to watch. I mean, they play an exciting brand <laughs> of is, hockey. Yeah. They really do. So, I mean, I, I almost would rather watch games like this than one nothing, two one oh, yeah. games. They're just totally. those are drubbing and boring. Like mm -hmm. watching Burns and Carlson is amazing. They, they're yeah. just they're such a high level. Yeah, there it's, aren't many dull moments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so, last topic I guess we have here is is uh, the coaching. So. Mm -hmm. We're not against the coaching. We're, we're on Pete DeBoer's side, and I think a lot of people are, but there is a growing number of people, especially in the Twitter troll verse, uh, right. that <laughs> want Pete DeBoer's head. And I think um, last week, Chicago had fired Joe Kenville, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people are, are now like going, oh, we should hire Kenville because the Sharks should be first place in the league because they're so good, and it's... It's really annoying. I was curious <laughs> on what your take on the coaching staff and, and yeah, the Kenville I mean, thing. you know, the 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 big stat that we've gone to a bunch over the last little while is that the year they made the Stanley Cup final, they were eighteen, eighteen and two on January fifth or something, mm -hmm. whatever it was. And eighteen, eighteen two is not a good record in this league. It's uh, it's a uh, it's 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 bottom half of the league for mm -hmm. sure. And Pittsburgh was actually the same thing. They were they weren't much better at that time, and and so they made their run. So. You know, to, to suggest that they need a coaching change 20 games in a season is asinine, <laughs> honestly. I mean, when you look at Pete DeBoer and his body of work here, I think you could make the case he's overachieved with all three of his teams. You look at the Stanley Cup final team, um, you know, that he not only did I think they improve the roster uh, throughout the course of that year, but I think, you know, they got used to him and his systems, and they, they you know, a lot of the veteran guys came to really like him. Mm -hmm. He gave them a lot of time off, he gives them their freedom. Um, you know, his second year, they had a real good team, if you remember, and then Joe Thornton gets hurt, Logan Couture gets hurt. I mean, that screwed them right there. They yeah. went into the playoffs against Edmonton with their top two centers. Yeah. playing hurt. I mean, they had no chance in that. Mm -hmm. wasn't, that wasn't Pete's fault. And last year, again, Thornton goes down. You bring in Evander Kane. And, you know, they basically changed their whole style of play over the last six weeks of the season. Mm -hmm. And they gave Vegas probably their toughest out uh, until they met Washington. So, um, you know, I, I would not agree with any sort of coaching move at this point. Um, and, you know, I see fans get upset. Auntie Suomela with a, was a healthy scratch here. <laughs> Look at the big picture. Yeah. This guy's in his first year in the National Hockey League. He's struggling to score, to put up points. Mm -hmm. When that happens, a guy is probably struggling with his confidence. You give him a, a game off, and, you know, since then he's got yeah. he's found the score sheet in four out of seven games. I mean, that was probably the right move. It worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah Yoakam I mean, Ryan, that's... same thing. You know, look, Yoakam Ryan's a good young player. Taking him out of the lineup... Yeah is not going to completely throw off mm -hmm. your whole team game. This it's going to hopefully help him in the long run. Yeah, yeah this is like it. our yeah. view of the show is we don't we don't dissect every game every every game really. We kind of take like a week or two like we do more of a macro view of, right. of the team and um, I mean we agree like like scratching guys for a game here and there is not going to ruin the team. And, yeah, we, and we thought at one point LeBanc might even get a scratch. I and thought that so would too, okay yeah. too yeah. Right? And it actually, I remember thinking the game he should have come out, I think he, he I think he actually had a golden, assi a golden assist or something that game. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I guess that was the right move to leave him in. And yeah. He's another guy. He's, it's with his confidence. You can tell watching him when he's confident and you can tell when he's not confident. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, he's young. He's, he's getting better. Yeah, he's he could get still go. I'm still not, he could go either way at this yeah. point, I think. But uh, he does have just some undeniable skill and, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I thought he was going to come out of the lineup too, but but they left him in there, so yeah. Yeah, they don't have many options now having to carry eight D. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, gosh, imagine that Pete DeBoer knows what he's doing, and, and we don't. <laughs> really, so. Yeah. Well, I well, mean, now we'll probably get fired tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> First in the Pacific, though, um, and and you still get people, you know, kind of uh, mm -hmm. calling for it. Um, and I think they're on pace right now for like 92 points or something to that effect, which doesn't sound like a whole lot when you look at the end of the year. But right. when you consider that we haven't been playing up to our full potential and we're starting to get to that point. And you're integrating a, such a huge piece in right. the team. And, you know, if Eric Carlson starts producing like Eric Carlson is supposed to produce and they just play a little bit more responsible defensively, I mean... Mm -hmm. It's a damn good team, I yeah. think. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, in St. Louis game, the last St. Louis game was a really good um, indicator of that where instead of giving up six breakaways like the game yeah. before, <laughs> they gave up none and go figure, a 4-0 yeah. win, right? So they hand it right back to St. Louis. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with the coach from time to time, and I did too. You know, I couldn't figure out why he split up the, the Hurdle-Meyer-Couture uh, line. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I understood his line of thinking, but it didn't work, and, and, 
and you know eventually put him back together and I thought he realized it I, yeah. I didn't really understand why he did that um, there was something else too that uh, I thought he was playing Eric Carlson too much I don't mm -hmm. think I didn't think there was any reason to play him 27 minutes a game when he was struggling early on mm -hmm. listen you can criticize the coach it's I'm not saying he's Pete's above any sort of criticism whatsoever but to call for his head and to to, for, for, to suggest after 20 games that they should replace their coach was just, yeah. I mean, the guy literally deserved uh, consideration for the Jack Adams last year, I yeah, think. Definitely. So, and but if you look at this first two stops, you know, in Florida and New Jersey, his his roster got progressively worse yeah. season to season. That mm -hmm. was the biggest reason that he um, ended up getting fired from both places is because the, the, the general managers weren't doing him any favors yeah. there. And, you know, the other thing I hear pretty often is that, well, the biggest criticism of him in New Jersey was he didn't handle the young players, the young players in the New Jersey system very well. Go back and look at all the young players they were complaining about right now. They all sucked. <laughs> They're all out of the league <laughs> now. They're left on the team. No, there's not. He wasn't yeah. playing them because they weren't any good. Yeah. And the, the young guys here, you look at, you know, the, a big thing with the coach, you want, your, you want the young players to get better. And, you know, look at a t guy like Timo Meyer. And how he's progressed under Pete, um, you know. Even t you know Thomas Hurdle is still pretty young, and he, he's when he's stayed healthy, he's gotten better. Yeah. So, um, you know, LeBanc, same thing. So, um, yeah, that's my piece on DeBoer. <laughs> <laughs> Again, cool. seriously though, yeah. go if you're one of those people that thinks DeBoer's not handling young players very well, go back and go back and look at. I can't think of their names now. Go back and the look league. them up, <laughs> right? Because they didn't amount to anything, yeah. and they weren't playing because he recognized that they weren't any good. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Doug Wilson's certainly doing uh, uh, Pete DeBoer some favors with all the acquisitions and, and whatnot. So, yep. um, yeah, kind of hard to say, uh, let's kick the guy out the door. He's doing pretty well, <laughs> I would say. So, yeah, that's I agree. all there is there. So, yeah. anyway, uh, was there anything else you wanted to kind of pick his brain uh, about while we got him here? Not on camera. No? Okay. We, <laughs> unlike Dan, we have given him food and while we gave him some water. Well, not right. food, but <laughs> he's still locked in the, in the, uh, the garage here, so... Anyway, the set. Is that what this is? Yeah. A garage? Yeah, yeah, it's a garage. Yeah, <laughs> giving away all the secrets. <laughs> in any case, uh, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for your insights yeah, and for jumping yeah, on the show. Yeah, Thanks sure. for coming. Yeah, we'll, appreciate you. Know, we'll you. do it again for sure. Yeah. Appreciate you being on here, and we have oh, a wow. good for you too gift for coming on wow, the show. Yeah, there you right. are. Yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely awesome. enjoy that one. I definitely will. Off camera. So, uh, once again, uh, Kevin Kurz with The Athletic. Go check him out. Um, it's worth the subscription. So I think you have to what, skip on Thanks. a cup of coffee here and there. Is yeah. That what it costs uh, you there? Yeah. It's what, three ninety nine a month? Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. 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 That's one Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. In any case, thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 24 of The Fin Factor. Thanks. So we will see you guys next week. Next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out the show. You can support us by following us at The Fin Factor on Twitter and Facebook. You can also find us on Instagram as at Fin Factor. If you're listening to us as a podcast, please, please, please give us a five-star review. And if you want to support our show, share our episode with your friends. Please leave us a comment of what you thought of this episode. And if you want us to cover anything else, let us know.